Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon for some, good morning for others. Welcome to the PAE Attention Framework webinar hosted by the National Center for Advancing Person Center Practices and Systems. Today, we'll be talking uh, really deep, doing a deep dive into understanding the ingredients for successful stakeholder engagement. We're delighted that you all are with us. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We'll be waiting for a minute as we work to advance the slides. Uh, I will introduce myself and uh, we'll, we'll keep working our way through. My name is Alex Bonardi and I am one of the co-directors of NCAPS. Could we have the next slide, please? Hmm, we seem to be having a, a slight issue with advancing of the slides. So what I will do is I'm going to work my way through the beginning part of uh, our conversation and then we will uh, hopefully be able to move forward relatively quickly. So what I was going to say uh, when we see the slides move forward, I think we're just doing a reshare. I really thank you for, for joining us to learn about stakeholder engagement. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the National Center on Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Systems. Thank you. It looks like we've got the slide up. NCAPS is funded by the Administration for Community Living and Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, all of these webinars are free, open, available to the public, and uh, will be recorded. My name is Alex Bonardi. I'm one of the co-directors, and I'm also joined by Bevan Croft. Uh, who is going to be uh, on the webinar a little bit later on. Um, what I would like to do now is uh, just to learn a little bit about who is joining us. Uh, what we're hoping to do is to bring up a poll uh, and ask participants to engage in the poll just to briefly answer what roles and what role do you self-identify? You'll notice on this poll that uh, you, you can scroll down. There's a little gray bar in the box that you're seeing. So you can also scroll down. There are a few more response options there. So I will leave the poll open for about another uh, eight to 10 seconds. And uh, thank you for everybody who is taking the time to engage. It's really helpful for us to know who is participating on these webinars. Okay, we have, um, we have a few people with people who have responded in and here are the poll results from the people who were able to respond. Uh, we see that we have uh, some people who uh, identify as being a person with a disability, uh, family members, uh, about 17%. Uh, we have 13% uh, who identify as being self-advocate smallish number of people who identify as peer specialists or peer mentors. Uh, we have clinical uh, folks, social workers, counselors or care managers, about 24%, researcher analysts. And, um, and the largest number I would say is government employees, about 42%, federal, state, tribal or municipal. Thank you everyone for responding uh, to this poll. So brief background, uh, the goal of NCAPS is to promote system change that makes person-centered principles not just an aspiration, but a reality in the lives of people across the lifespan. In order to do that, um, engagement with people who receive services is critical. Next slide, please. Just a few uh, logistics uh, for your information. As is mentioned in the chat, uh, people will be muted during this webinar and you can use the chat feature in Zoom to post questions. Please do, please post questions and uh, you can communicate both with the hosts and each other. Uh, we do plan to have question and answer format towards the end so we can answer your questions in chat there. This webinar is live captioned in both English and Spanish. Uh, the English captioning is available right through the Zoom 
link and the Spanish captions are available at the link that you see on your screen there. Uh, there are polls and evaluation questions that we will be having at the very end. And uh, thank you for taking the time and staying with us right through to the end to help us with our evaluation questions. Next slide, please. At the, after the webinar, you can send follow-up questions. Uh, that will, we will be uh, monitoring follow-up for sure. And so we will be uh, looking forward to, to hearing from you. The webinar is being recorded and will be available along with a PDF version of slides, a plain language summary, and uh, in many cases, responses to your questions. Next slide, please. And without any further ado, I am delighted to introduce the speakers that we have uh, with us today. Erin uh, McGaffigan has 22 years of experience in long-term services and supports for older adults and people with diverse disabilities. Her PAE attention framework developed as a result of her 2011 dis dissertation informs her work with people, uh, with program administrators, researchers, advocates, health plan administrators, and people with lived experience to design and improve stakeholder engagement activities. Keith Jones, who's also joining us, president of Soul Touching Experiences, is an African American activist and entrepreneur with cerebral palsy. As a strong advocate for independent quality of living in the community, Mr. Jones has participated actively in addressing various issues that people with disabilities face. These areas include housing, education, and the ever-important voting access. Anne Fracht has been advocating for herself and others for years and has received multiple awards for this work. She's worked at Advocates, Inc. as a self-advocacy coordinator since 2009. Ms. Fracht, Anne, has sat on many advisory groups to inform program design and improvements, including boards, strategic planning work groups, human rights committees, and more. Thank you for joining us, Anne. And finally, we have Bob Weir, who is currently uh, the Home and Community-Based Policy Analyst for the State of Oregon's Department of Human Services, Aging, and People with Disabilities Program. Bob's experience includes work for people with developmental disabilities, adolescents in the Oregon State Hospital, and 31 years focused on seniors and people with physical disabilities. We have a broad range of experience with us and we're delighted to have everyone with us here. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Erin McGaffigan to take it away. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with the objectives. As Alex mentioned, my name is Erin McGaffigan and I run Collective Insight. We're an organization devoted specifically to stakeholder engagement. So as you can imagine, I'm really excited to be here with this panel today. Um, I am going to talk really briefly about these three major objectives for today's panel. The first one is really to take time to recognize that there are a range of experiences and outcomes that result from stakeholder engagement. Some people have really good experiences. Some people have really frustrating experiences. So we really, we have for you a simple framework to guide your engagement activities, hopefully towards the more positive experiences. And the panel is here today um, to provide the real life examples of how this framework can, uh, can build stakeholder trust, which is absolutely essential for your success with engagement. Next slide, please. So before we get there, I'm going to take a minute to just define stakeholder engagement for us, since we may all be coming from a various different viewpoints here on what we mean. Um, the original old school Oxford English Dictionary of stakeholder, um, or where this, this word really comes from, is around holders of wages, of, you know, betting in a game, or even um, having a stake in property. But we're moving beyond that definition to a more um, a definition about involving an individual or a group that impacts your work. It's really that simple or will be impacted by your work. Um, we feel like there are many types of stakeholders, participants, people with lived experience, often referred to as service users and sometimes self-advocates are what I would call kind of primary stakeholders. Um, but there are also other stakeholders too that again have a role in um, 
in how your work or programs are rolled out. And those are often referred to as support brokers, case managers, direct care providers, advocacy groups, community members in general who, you know, for which you're developing programs to, to reside, for people to reside in the community, and the elected and, and not elected public officials. So as you can see, we have a, a range of stakeholders. And when we're talking about stakeholder engagement, we are talking about many different stakeholders. I think it's really important to recognize, especially um, in light of the, the pandemic um, and the Black Lives Matter movement, is that power typically plays a role in um, when, how, and who we define as stakeholders. And I, I think we could spend quite a bit of time discussing that more. But this engagement, this pay attention engagement framework is intended to work with public health frameworks and social justice frameworks to help you understand how to engage communities um, impacted by both COVID and um, social justice. So um, next slide, please. Oh, I think there is one more. I'm sorry. Um, this one. Yes, thank you. Well, actually, yes. Sorry if I missed that. Um, so stakeholder engagement, we talked a little bit about the defining of stakeholder. The actual process of engagement is the, in, the, in, the uh, involving of these individuals in the design, implementation, and or improvement of something. So you'll notice there that there are multiple phases in which engagement could happen. And I would argue that the strongest engagement happens over that continuum. Um, but then also people can engage stakeholders in the design of a service, the design of a program, um, the restructuring of a system, and also even approach within a program, say how to develop outreach strategies or how to inform or improve your person-centered practices. These are examples of focus areas for engagement. Um, I would say that comprehensive engagement uh, usually includes more than one stakeholder. Again, I would say your primary stakeholders often and should be users of services, people with lived experience, but comprehensive engagement strategies often include multiple stakeholder groups, may maybe in very different ways, but people who, again, are impacted or have, have are, are going or impact your success in the design of your program. So more than one stakeholder group, but also multiple methods for engagement. Ultimately, um, I think it's important to recognize that not everybody can or wants to be engaged in the same way. So thinking about that as you, as you implement your engagement strategies. That being said, um, I often tell people to go start somewhere with somebody, reflect and improve it. Um, perfection can be your enemy, but just making sure you're moving forward in some sort of engagement strategies. Um, oftentimes people are seeking participant or consumer engagement that's, you know, because they're people who are users of services are directly impacted. Um, and so often people come to me and say, I wanna involve participants. And what I just would like to remind people of that sometimes engaging participants also, again, it means engaging other groups for which sometimes for right or wrong um, can act as um, gatekeepers or can really shed some light on um, effective and accessible strategies for communication for the participants you're actually trying to engage. Okay, next slide. So a little bit about how I got here. Um, I, there's a couple of people on this panel that I've known for 20 years now. I became interested in the um, engage, stakeholder engagement when I was newly out of grad school and um, joined a Real Choice Systems Change Grant. And I'm sure there's a few people that know of these systems change grants and learned really quickly um, that from the side of an advocate perspective, I was an able-bodied white woman trying or stealing people's money. And I know that sounds harsh, but it really did shed light on, um, for me, on the power dynamic and the responsibility I had to make sure that there was timely and accessible stakeholder engagement strategies. So we learned a lot from that process, including the importance of an implementation group instead of an advisory group. You can learn all about that if you join this link right here and see this brochure with the lessons learned from that process. That was my trigger for stakeholder engagement. That's what got me interested in it. Thank you to everybody that was part of that process. You'll meet two of the many people that were part of that process in this panel today. And um, it really did lead to my research in the pay attention framework. So with that said, next slide. I'd like to get the group to go ahead to um, start 
a discussion here about the good and the bad experience of engagement. So we have a few people on the call today in the panel, and I actually think it's going to be um, Bob that kicks us off with telling us a little bit from Bob's perspective, what are some good and bad experience to his engagement? And what was the outcome for the, these experiences? Thank you, Erin. I'm going to start with um, two examples of bad experiences and two examples of, of good positive experiences and I'll end with the positive when, or end on, on a positive note. I think you know when there's no engagement or very um, minimal engagement then the negative outcome you see is what we're seeing today with protests or boycotts of, of, business, of, of businesses. So I think it, it's so critical to have good stakeholder engagement. Um, a, another example, a little more complicated, is when a what I call a rubber stamp um, process, where culturally and probably unspoken, but the belief is that the stakeholder group you've gotten together is supposed to support everything that the organization brings to it, and basically just rubber stamp your ideas, and they don't really have um, a critical role, and that leads to negative outcomes of high turnover on those on those stakeholder groups, um, uh, a hard time recruiting individuals to be on those groups because really there there is little um, engagement occurring. On a more on the more positive side, um, I think when you have good engagement, you can achieve great things. And I would point to to uh, or credit Oregon stakeholders with really driving Oregon to be the first state in the country to look at um, how to move, move people from institutions into the community, getting the first waiver of Medicaid to be able to, to pay for um, people outside of institutions and, and move people in that direction. So you can really do really strong and great things with consumers. I think the next slide we have a, a an illustration of something not so grandiose, but I think just as um, positive, in which we had tended to write up paper um, fact sheets um, on our policies, and we were working with the home and community-based federal rules and trying to work with stakeholders on how would we communicate this out. And the idea through that stakeholder group led to kind of this idea of a visual fact sheet, one in which um, we got the stakeholders involved with, with submitting pictures and, and it was really to try to get even at, at people that may not be literate or really understand very complex things, but to take a very hard, complex federal role and boil it down to this really was a positive outcome. We ended up with, um, as far as we know, our first ever what we call a visual fact sheet to help illustrate uh, a very complicated subject in terms of the home and community-based rules. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ann. Center planning and self-direction and self-determination. I was on a planning group, a committee that um, formed a toolkit, Tools for Tomorrow. And this, this tried to get people, show parents and other advocacy groups that people could live independently and also people from institutions could live independently and parents could let go of their loved ones and let them be on their own. I was living independently at the time and doing a good job of it. From this work came other other groups on um, self-determination, self-direction, and person-centered planning. Being involved in all of these committees um, showed were steps of my own independence. So the outcome for the state person was, was that they could see it was possible. The outcome for me was that I was able to improve my skills. This then helped me with my own independence. Recently, with COVID-19, I've seen people living in group homes using virtual meetings. Through these virtual meetings, we have informed staff that, the, 
that they need to tell people why they have to wear masks, not just tell them to wear them. People wear masks when you take the time to help them understand why. There are a lot of committees that I feel I don't fit into because they think I'm the spokesperson for the IDD community. This is bad because I'm there just as a person with IDD so they have someone, but no one's listening to you. No one's talking to you and everyone has their own ideas. They're using you because you have a disability. The project gets done, but there's nothing on the project that represents or addresses the real challenges that people with IDD face. Great, thank you, Anne. Um, Keith, did you wanna say something about, uh, about outcomes? Sure, um, this is Keith Jones, thank you. Uh, one of the things that we learned in terms of the good experiences is that well, let, let's do the inverse. The bad experience is what we're witnessing now in every movement and every issue uh, facing the country at the moment, where there are instances in which policy and outcomes have nothing to do with the people who are directly affected by it. So in such, you get negative feedback. You get people not wanting to follow or feeling like they've been engaged in the process. That's on the macro scale on the scale in which we're talking about in terms of the good experiences, is that those organizations who understand that the work that they're doing is a job, but the people they're doing the work for, it's their life. So the experiences that we had on CPIG or the Consumer Planning and Implementation Group was that we understood that at the end of the day, we are the ones who are going to face the consequences and or good or bad of the policy. And for public health officials, it dawned on them that just because they're officials, there are bodies at the end of those discussions. So in the outcome, we both understood that we both were working for a common goal. And so that if you don't take anything away, it's to understand that you are on the same side as the individual in which you started the job to work for. Great. Thank you, Keith. Mm -hmm. Um, so, as I mentioned on the next slide, you know, I did, I did dissertation research on this and I, I spent some time with cash and counseling with the specific self-direction model, looking at stakeholder engagement across 15 programs and then went deep in three, kept those states confidential intentionally so I could have some really, really important conversations and interviews with um, advocates, um, people with lived experience and policymakers about why some people are having such positive experiences and why you're having such um, such frustrating experiences. Um, and here is a sample of, of some of the pieces that I saw concrete examples of when engagement work, the outcomes that came out of it and on the left and when engagement didn't work so well, the, um, the frustrating pieces that came out of it on the right. Um, and you, you heard Anne speak today specifically about one of these, which is increasing knowledge and skills. Um, you know, one was specific to actual the people that she worked with realizing and the families realizing that, hey, self-advocates can do this. They can be here and they can actually be a part of the process and doing so build confidence, which is another example of, of an outcome here, empowerment. Um, but then you also heard um, some frustrations in, in, you know, feeling that sometimes engagement has little or no income. I mean, little or no outcome. So I would say to the group, um, you know, in my research, I have the, the, perf the story of both worlds. I had interviewed some people who talked about engagement leading to less work um, and more improved program design. So for instance, with having the ability to work with a, con a work group of stakeholders to develop a policy manual. It was less work because the actual people stood up and, 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 and assisted with that policy manual. Um, and the same with budget cuts. Um, people feeling as though engaging stakeholders actually sustain their model because when people heard that the program was going to be cut, they're already somewhat um, organized in their communication. They went to the public hearings. They said, no, don't cut this program. The program wasn't cut. So why are people sometimes having really good experience, some people having really frustrating experience? 
Um, that research I was able to do helped me develop the framework, which is on the next slide. Um, and I think so far this framework hasn't um, done me wrong in terms of engagement. Next slide, please. So we call it the pay attention framework. Um, and I'd be interested in having conversations with anybody in this call if they feel like that there are things missing in this framework, we're always looking to improve it. Um, but what you'll hear today from these panelists are examples of people, approach, and environment playing a direct impact on the success of engagement. Um, and so the reason we do this, or the reason I frame it this way is because I, I think oftentimes people think it's simply the approach. You know, whether it's virtual, COVID-19, or in person, you know, I think there's a, a real hypersensitivity to strategy or approach. What I think sometimes gets lost in the weeds are the people and the environment too. So just from the people, you know, you'll hear very concrete, helpful examples of this, but who is doing the engagement matters? Their, their lived experience, their personal experience with whether it be disability or aging, um, their skill set and facilitation, um, the people they're engaging matters, thinking a lot about who you're trying to get to represent others and what that means. The approach, of course, is not lost in a lot of people, accessibility, um, communication strategies. But what I think people don't realize is there's like upwards of 10 or 11 elements of approach that have to be thought out to make engagement work well. And we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll see that specifically in some of the examples. And then of course, environment. We don't have to look far um, within this pandemic um, and within the, the most recent um, conversations around um, race, that environment matters um, and that sometimes something in the environment triggers more of an interest for stakeholder engagement or more resources for stakeholder engagement or a requirement for stakeholder engagement, which was really what triggered my work is the CMS grants requiring stakeholder engagement back in 2002. Um, I'm not quite sure, honestly, what would have happened if that wasn't the case. Slide, please. <clears throat> so I, I'm not gonna, I'd love to say that um, the pay attention framework is the only framework. Of course it's not. There are a lot of really great frameworks out there that should inform engagement. Um, and here's just a few. So absolutely look around at these frameworks. They all bring something special and unique to the discussion of stakeholder engagement. Next slide. <clears throat> so let's talk about the people. Um, let's talk a little bit about the people. What skills or characteristics have you seen panelists as important to make engagement work? Skills, hello, this is Keith. One of the skills that are important um, for, to make engagement work is one for people to understand that expertise in terms of a particular subject or policy may not be formal, uh, meaning you may not have trained in it in school and then graduated with a degree or went to a community organizing and graduated with a certificate. I think oftentimes what we discovered in, in uh, meaningful community, community engagement is that expertise is not always formal. And when you add culture to it, the way that most systems or state agencies view expertise is not the cultural definition of somebody who knows something. So one of the things that we find is that allowing for those, those experiences and that, that use of information, the real world knowledge to inform how the policy is actually translated uh, on the ground. Thank you, Keith. And what about you, Anne? Do you want to talk about from your work or your experiences um, being somebody who's been engaged in a lot of advisory councils? What skills and characteristics you feel are important to making engagement work? When people are listening to me, um, when they're empowering me and helping me grow and explaining what's, what's going on around me, um, this led me to playing a role in making decisions. They talk directly to me and take a moment to ask me what I think and not just ask me, but listen to what I have to say and make sure it makes a difference. I've come off of committees where my voice is requ was required because the people weren't doing these things. And I've stayed on committees where I was not required because people were doing these things. If I was to write a job description, 
I would add to this job description, the person needs to be understanding of people. Um, as some people need things explained more and time to figure things out. Not everyone can do th things as fast as everyone else and not everyone can achieve goals you have in mind. The person needs patience. For instance, now with COVID-19, taking time to ask people if they have the technology that is needed to video conference and providing the assistance needed to make video conferencing work. The person needs experience interacting with people with disabilities and being sensitive to how people feel. The person needs to have awareness of disability and differences in di inability. I have been in meetings where people say they are teaching their children what disability looks like. I told them disability doesn't always look like one thing. Um, and sometimes it's invisible. The assumptions you have about what I can and can't do because of my disability may be your biggest obstacle. If I were training self-advocates on how to be in a committee, I would say don't be afraid to speak up or to ask questions, but also allow time for others to speak. It's important to be able to ask for help. If you don't understand the word ask, um, it's important to get along with other co committee members. And now, these days, I would also say learn how to join your video conferences and make your points known, even on a video conference. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think, Bob, you're up next. Do you have any perspectives that you want to share about skill sets that you think would be insightful? Yeah, um, and I don't think they really differ from what we've heard. I might talk about it a little bit differently coming from the perspective of the organization that's trying to um, work with stakeholders from the organization perspective. I think from organizations that are trying to um, learn how to do this, they're, we're really talking in this people sector around really um, hopefully common sense, but, but difficult to do things. I think it's really critical as the people that are, that are doing the engagement that we're genuine, that we're authentic and that we're honest. Um, I think from my perspective, one of the most critical parts of the relationship is that we're trying to build a trusting relationship with those we work we work with and those that are feeling like they're being used or played nobody likes that and it's it's around the the golden rule do unto others you know treat others how we would want to be treated and that, and I know that sounds common sense but um but often the pressures um to do this engagement or to get to an answer that the organization wants makes some of those those things difficult. Um, secondly, I think it's important for those that are doing this work to have a passion for the subject. I personally am not a, a great public speaker, which will become clearer the more I I talk. But um, but I have a passion for this work, and I and I can definitely speak to people about about. The, the things I have a passion for. One of the most important um, things I would tell somebody that's getting into engagement is um, if you were to learn a lesson, a lesson that I've learned is forget the pressures of your organization to get to the outcome that the organization wants. Um, if we have a preconceived notion of where we want to get to, it really closes our mind from listening to others. And so even though we may um, have to get to an outcome based on some outside influence. So let's say a budget is being cut and, and many times the organization will have made the decision of where they want to cut and how they want to cut. And that really, you know, stymies engagement because the decision's already been made. We haven't really honestly gone out and asked 
for others others opinions on how we can go be able to be willing to change course be willing to really listen to folks and um come up with a strategy and don't um undersell um people's ability to understand complex concepts um and again be honest an example of that might be when we were um moving towards um a, adopting the the federal community home and community-based services rules many providers felt that those rules were um, difficult and and maybe even impossible to achieve in in Oregon system and so the question came up of do we have to follow those federal rules and the honest answer is no we don't have to Oregon could come up with the money to self-fund our programs and not rely on federal money to to assist Oregon's but that's about a 70 percent of our our budget so we would talk about you know a 70 percent loss in federal funds to Oregon and, and I think you know pretty soon you know the idea of of losing that much money and and the fact that it couldn't be replaced was an honest way to to talk to folks about you know how to come to a conclusion that that it would be in our best interest to try to align ourselves and, and figure out how to adopt these these rules and move forward but it's different than coming about it from a parental standpoint saying we know best we've already decided we must go forward and it's really about again having that that honest discussion i think to to summarize i think one of the hardest things to do is one of Stephen Covey's ha habits from the seven habits of highly effective people. And that's the, the one that says, uh, seek first to understand and then be understood. So I think when we're doing stakeholder engagement, it helps to go out and listen first and then, um, and then um, try to, to, to overlay that with, with working on solutions together as opposed to coming with the solutions already already um, packaged for folks. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Bob. Fantastic. So as you can hear, um, next slide, please. We, um, I, yeah, thanks. <laughs> you can hear a lot of, you can even hear in how people are speaking about the topic, the different skill sets and the, and the experiences and the mindsets that I think come with the people factors for engagement. And again, I feel like oftentimes these people factors are not well recognized. And so when people say they had an engagement process and it was frustrating or it didn't work, I often stop and listen to the factors or the points and what is being said. And oftentimes it's, it's of course a little bit of approach, but it's often the people um, that maybe have less experience or understanding of the importance of some of these things that um, the panelists have brought up. One topic from the research that I had done um, ended up being an entire chapter was this concept of representation. Um, you know, and I just want to pause for a minute. Again, that could be a whole webinar just on the concept of representation. Um, but I thought we would at least touch upon it today. I often hear people say, I want to involve real consumers or I want to involve real participants, people with lived experience. I think that is crucial, and I don't want to underestimate the importance of that being part of a major stakeholder engagement strategy and the driving force of the stakeholder engagement strategy. But what I would say is that um, oftentimes some people do that because of the potential combative nature of involving more systems advocates. I say both have an important role and seat at the table. Um, so I want you to just think about really clearly about who you want to engage and why you want to engage them and understand that people with lived experience who might not be systems advocates um, are coming with their individual experiences. But if you also are looking for a systems improvement strategy that looks across programs or across services, you got to think about who might not be represented um, in that voice and think about ways to involve people who might have formal connections to communities that you might not touch otherwise in your engagement process. You know, two-way communication loop, when you say, I want real consumers or participants, but then you're frustrated because those real participants can't represent a broader voice, understand that you can absolutely play a role in helping that person link to other systems or advocate groups to help them represent a larger role. But understand that people come with different experiences and knowledge bases, and that's going to influence um, the engagement process. 
So be clear uh, what you expect out of representation and why you're engaging the people you want to engage and use more than one method to get diverse views, I, I, would, I would always advocate for. Next slide, please. So um, again, from the research, this is from the direct interviews uh, with participants, people with lived experience, advocates, as well as um, um, program administrators that, you know, they were flat out asked, you know, what are important skill sets or practices of those who are doing the engagement? What are some skill sets and practices of those that are being engaged? Um, and then I also listened because there were a lot of the words that were being used and the terms that were being used pointed to some other factors or skill sets that um, were important as well. So this is the list that we have. Um, again, people who are responsible for engagement, and I know that people who are, people have lived experience also can be facilitators or engagement. I'm not trying to be terribly black and white, but what I'm trying to do is provide you some understanding of the skill sets of somebody, if you're going to appoint somebody, um, preferably somebody with lived experience in an engagement strategy, um, even if they're not, these are, the, these are the skill sets and the, and the beneficial tools to have on the left-hand side. Very strong and transparent communicators, communicators um, to, the, to the point that Bob had mentioned about you know, being okay with saying, hey, yes, we could, but here's our reality um, when it comes to HCBS services or home and community-based services. You heard it a few times. Um, listen before speaking. Um, but just being really good listeners, being comfortable with silence, being able to digest large bits of communication, some frustration, some ideas, and be able to synthesize it into themes to influence your work. Um, so strong communication and good listening, demonstration of respect, the ability to run to and not away from conflict, when conflict is um, recognized to be part of a process, and we have good conflict resolution skills, that makes all the difference from moving from point A to point B. Um, Teamwork, uh, you know, in a lot of these interviews, I heard a lot of um, we and not them and us, but we and, you know, we're going to do this together um, or, as opposed to those people. I think you would see that um, the people that are most effective with stakeholder engagement um, really come with a more teamwork emphasis and, and, and far less um, interested in controlling the process. And again, either personal experience or direct comfort level with actual disability is, is, is important. So we heard a lot of things that, that, I mean, that was for my research, but I heard other things today in addition to good listeners being a genuine, authentic, you know, the honest piece um, from Keith, um, recognizing that some people can go home and not have to think about some of these systems and other people live these systems. They live these services. And, and so understanding that, that, that difference and, and being really empathetic and, 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 and factual in that being, I think helps move the process along. Individuals being engaged, you know, ideally, again, if you asked and you heard it a lot from Anne today, um, being informed, um, understanding what you're trying to accomplish um, understanding the boundaries of your program is always helpful to individuals you're engaging. Being strong communicators, strong advocates, yet ready to partner, I heard time and time again, um, kind of this, this boundary of like pushing the envelope, but understanding people are all in it, hopefully for the right reasons and are trying to, you know, move a system forward and we all have our, our obstacles. So being strong advocates, but yet ready to partner. Confidence, which comes over time, in time and energy. I mean, oftentimes people go to the few people in, the, um, in their system who they know um, have been engaged before, but in doing that, they also know that people are very busy. Um, and it, it really takes a lot of time and energy to be prepared, to participate. <clears throat> so ability to have the time and, and resources to actually engage. These are all the people factors we understand there's more, we heard about them today. And not everybody comes with these capacities. What we're trying to do is recognize some of the things that make engagement successful so that you can think about these characteristics as you recruit for somebody to facilitate a process, as you put out an outreach flyer to engage, and as you develop capacity building strategies with community partners. You know, there are plenty of people out there who are already doing a lot of this skill building with, with people with lived experience and advocates. So understanding that their work is essential for people to be successful. Next slide. Um, so we're gonna move on to the approach. Um, and I think you can see how they're connected, right? People 
are designing the approach. Um, so your person factors absolutely have an impact on your approach. Um, but they, they do play on each other, but they also independently are very essentially, very important. So at this point, I'm gonna ask um, our panel to talk about examples of how the approach has made a difference. And I'm gonna actually ask Bob to jump in first, if you're okay with that, Bob. Oh, certainly. Yeah, so one of the concepts I wanna put out there around when you're thinking about approach is just um, understanding or at least my perception is that anytime we're going to engage with folks, we're really talking about change, almost always universally talking about change. And I think us as humans um, see change often as a threat. And, um, and so that creates a conflict by itself, um, even positive change. And an example of that might be that um, let's say that we decided we want to close all institutions and that everyone has a right to live in the community and we're going to do that tomorrow. Well, even that would would create conflict in the sense that people would lose jobs. We might lose tax revenue from those businesses that close, things like that. So even positive um, change will often have or something that's viewed as a positive change will often have a conflict. And, and I just want to support that, that really when we're thinking about the approach, we're thinking about setting up a situation that is going to have conflict within it. So I think um, Aaron was talking about not running from conflict, which is so true. We're really, in fact, to be truly setting up a good engagement, the approach is around setting up diverse um, beliefs and attitudes around something so that um, we're setting up a situation where conflict is naturally going to come to the surface. And so thinking about how, how we do that is, is really critical. And one of the, the points that um, in doing that, I want to think about um, if you're brand new to, to this and you're just thinking about a system, is that concept of representation and who do we have involved in whatever engagement that we're going to do. So um, in Oregon, we I think of it in three ways. A lot of times people want to be engaged at the level that they want to be appraised of what is going on and, and just um, not directly engaging, but but be aware of what's happening and, and be communicated with. So that broad group is, it can be done in multiple ways. You can, we create um, lists of anyone that's been on our stakeholder groups and we email um, updates out to those folks and invite them to calls and, and do other things that can keep them engaged and know what's happening. Um, you can also post things on websites and have the websites um, um, have a way to, um, sign up to get updates and stay involved. So that really allows for a broad lot of people to be involved with, with the system. But sometimes we're wanting to, you know, engage with, with a group or with people. And we have some standard groups. We have both stakeholder groups for, for older adults and younger people with physical disabilities um, at the state level. And then at every um, local level, we have those groups. And other times we're still um, going to wrestle with something and we want to invite folks, folks to do that work. And as we're looking at diversity, sometimes those groups can be very big in terms of all the people that we've wanted to get involved. And then the approach might be thinking something like we're going to have the bigger group work and bless the work of some subgroups that, that come under that work to, because it's really difficult to do um drafting of communications or things with a with a large group but that large group can be a good pulse check and allow us to um, um have have people involved at, at a larger level less less with the day-to-day -day work but then we can have those subgroups and have the committee members not staff present the information that comes from those those subgroups again supporting that um idea of of um people doing the, the work. Um, so I think those are some really um, broad ways to think about the approach. And I want to just acknowledge that we have a long way to go to um, um, get good representation of both in Oregon. It can be urban and rural representation. It can be people of color. It can be 
um, tribes. It can be a lot of different um, ways that we're trying to to do a better job getting out to to all the folks. So I think we're always trying to improve the approaches to get better diversity, um, get out to all people, and um, and and do this work. So um, other things around around the approach that, that people might think of is, is it can be helpful to have ground rules in your meetings or develop those as a group from the beginning, like, um, you know, how we're going to behave or to develop a charter that can kind of be a, a document, a formal document that says this is the task at hand and um, it, it can describe what's in scope for the group and what's not in scope so that that can help a little bit with the um, side um, uh, channels that sometimes groups want to go down. At other times, though, we get back to that people element where it's really important if we if something is really needs to be discussed by the group, we allow that to happen and not just use the charter to say that's out of bounds. If something's going to get in the way of the work, we want to, again, go back to first listen and then um, and then work where, where people are at. And I'll stop there. And I think Anne might have some some other thoughts that she's going to share. So I think the approach for for me and for other self advocates to start with um, not using really large words, um, breaking down acronyms and sometimes using visuals are really helpful. Um, people talking to you and not at you and including you in conversations, um, knowing that they want to hear from you and acknowledging you in the conversations and that they want your point of view, not just what you're thinking, but they really want, want you to be included in their conversations. Um, I need to be able to trust the person and the people around me and to feel comfortable and then speak up. And when people aren't going too fast, then I could understand them and take and taking my time to to make sure and when they're taking their time to make sure everyone's getting what they're saying. And smaller groups allows time to ask and answer questions, as opposed to large groups where nobody knows what any, anyone's saying. And having materials a couple days early to review and having not too many materials always helps. So when you're in a, a large group and you don't know what's going on around you, then there's more tendency to drop off because you don't know what's happening. Thank you, Anne. Keith, do you have things to add in terms of approach? And then I could do some slides of key elements. Yes, can you hear me? Can you? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, I just want to make sure. Well, some of the approaches uh, that we have found successful is acknowledging that there's a history uh, when people come into communities, particularly communities of color or various uh, disability communities that may have not ever had their voices um, added to the discussion, particularly when it's around their around their health and their well-being. So the approach that, that, that we've seen successful is a collaborative effort, but the collaborative effort based upon those those who quote would typically be seen in power, i.e., the state, the state agency or the organization running um, running the program, is understanding that yes, it's and again we go back to this that this is not punitive. That the people who will be at the end of your services must have a voice in how those services are developed and delivered. 
if you are not paying attention to those who you're serving, are you really serving them the way you say you're supposed to? So the mixture of community voices, policy experts, organizational experts, but all working from the shared experience and understanding that the consumer, even though is asking to be sat at the table, is really the end user and will evaluate whether or not the approach is successful. Thanks, Keith. Great, great points. So um, I think I'm just going to recap a lot of what I heard. Um, the next slide, please. So these are common themes um, that are coming directly from either people that, again, are doing the engagement or being engaged on the other side of engagement. Um, I heard a lot. So this is from the research I've done. And so far, it stood the test of time in the work that I have been doing. But I heard a lot of the examples directly from the panel. Um, I know people are going to be really frustrated when they see that this slide doesn't tell them that steering committees of six to eight people are the way to go or that you have to use focus groups. Um, that's intentional. I know it's frustrating, but really it depends. And again, it goes back to the people and the approach and the environment. I think you really have to, I, I recommend using um, approach that is driven by what you're trying to accomplish, but also takes into account um, a lot of the, you know, the things that have to, the, the engagement strategies that are already happening, so the assets that you already have, as long as, along with your timeline and when decisions are being made. So, sorry, I apologize, but what we do do here is provide you some clear points that regardless if it, the engagement strategy is in person, regardless if the engagement strategy um, is uh, virtual, uh, whether it's an advisory committee or a community forum, that you have a clear purpose and you have buy-in from your stakeholders on that purpose and what you're trying to accomplish. That you figure out engagement strategies that include a mix of stakeholders. They might not always be in one group. Um, there's different experiences and thoughts about joining groups, collaborative groups with more than one population or stakeholder group versus having individual groups. It, re it really depends. It depends on a, quite a few different things. But that having a mix of stakeholders in your engagement strategy um, is really helpful overall. Accessible information, you've heard um, Anne talk about having information ahead of time, um, ag agendas, um, uh, you know, a clear charter with going back to the purpose, meeting guidelines. These are all things that even Bob had also referenced that are important, accessible pieces of information, um, short, concise, um, if you needed large print, braille, um, recording, you just really have to stop to the next point and ask, what do you need to be accessible? What are your needs as an individual coming to this process? Um, how, how long ahead do you need materials? Um, what kind of formats are beneficial to you? You can see how person factors play in here, right? Because if I feel like as a person who's facilitating this process that accessibility matters, I will take the time to ask these questions ahead of time. And then I will make sure that the resources are devoted to getting them done and being consistent. Um, oftentimes the timing of engagement is predetermined. So for instance, quarterly meetings um, or a annual forum. What I would say is be thoughtful in the timing and when decisions are being made. Nothing more frustrating than to bring a stakeholder group together, have really important conversations, but to realize that those decisions were already made last month, or to realize that they're not gonna be made for another six months. So really thinking about, okay, if we already have a meeting scheduled, it's quarterly, how do we use that, even though we're making decisions monthly, to inform our process, or how do we use other stakeholder engagement processes to include that? I mean, to inform that monthly decision making. So, you know, it goes up to the next bullet on the next column, you know, making sure that there's more than one way. I've seen states do a great job of, um, of developing websites that uh, share people, um, share with people information about their, their program and initiative, how to get involved and how to share, you know, how to become a part of the, the steering committee or advisory committee, how to share a question or concern by email, how to listen in to um, a meeting that's already happening or how to access maybe an archive of a meeting that's already happening. So multiple methods of engagement are important because people engage differently. Um, and that's helpful when the timing may, may be not always align directly with when you need to make a decision. 
Um, facilitation strategies, you heard Anne talk a lot about facilitation strategies. You know, having somebody, whether it be co-facilitated with a leader from the community um, and a state person or completely facilitated by the community, I just think thoughtful facilitation practices um, are important where people understand that people in the room or virtually in the room um, have different ways of learning and different processing. And so thinking about how to you know, read the room um, is really important to an engagement strategy and knowing when to stop and make sure those meeting guidelines are being um, well used, that people are not talking over each other, that people um, have a chance to speak up um, even if they're quiet. Um, transparent decision making strategies. I think that um, most people recognize that sometimes decisions happen outside of an engagement process, but understanding when and how that happens and what their role is in this process, and then closing that loop. You know, we heard you, this is what we heard, this is how we informed our, our practices. That validates that the work was, was not for nothing, um, and it actually allows people to show up again. So thinking about the fact that consensus building, while often not always possible, um, is in a way to make sure that all the views are heard and that the product ultimately is somehow informed of the many different views that exist. Um, and then staffing and time, you know, that ob obviously um, having a budget to, to, to uh, implement engagement is really critical. Um, it costs time, it costs money, but if you do it well, it actually, from many point of views, would actually, people would say it saves you time and money. Um, from my PR perspective and from a program improvement perspective. Next slide. So I think, I think it was even Nicole with HSRI that had mentioned in the chat, I glanced really quickly, some great concrete tools around board development. And there's just so many out there. And I think that the, you know, if you're looking for that concrete, like how to start a meeting, we definitely can get you those resources. That's not a problem. What I think people, um, what we're hoping to bring today is to recognize that there, there are many factors at play that then allow you to be sex, successful in implementing those, those toolkits. In other words, most of the people who are looking for those toolkits have a lot of the persons and the people factors that we described earlier and the environment is calling for it. So thank you, Nicole. Um, so now environment. Um, let's talk about environment here. Um, I think it's Ian that's gonna kick us off. Um, Ian, do you mind telling us examples of when in your work environment had mattered? Environment always matters. Um, one thing I've noticed that makes a difference is that most of the committees I've been on were required to have a diverse committees, meaning that um, family, families and people with all disabilities and people of all races, of diverse races. Um, this was good because we got many different viewpoints and you learn from each other. Also, many communities require to include people with disabilities. I don't think I would have been on the committee if they didn't have that mandate. But like I said, if their approach isn't good, I leave the group, which means if they do actually don't explain things and include you, then I leave. Again, COVID-19 is a change in our environment. With, we're realizing that people with intellectual disabilities can learn how to use video conferencing. Many of us did not know how to use video conferencing before COVID-19. And we're now actually almost required to teach people to, to learn how to use it to communicate. Thank you, Ian. Um, I think for next, we're looking for Bob. Do you wanna jump in? Sure, certainly. Yeah, for the environment, you know, um, working for me, I represent government and many times we can't take sides on issues. So having um, stakeholders that are aware and informed creates an environment where the consumers and advocates voices speak louder than that of 
the the bureaucrats. Um, and from my experience, the the voice of the people is always more powerful than us politicians or or people that work for government. So, so one of the benefits of of um, engagement um, with folks is is having folks well versed and that they can they can represent themselves in terms of you know any legislative proposals um that are happening um one thing we've done to create an environment that supports this is um and i think there's a slide that shows this that we've created a for any policy work we do we we have a template that um if you look up in the in the top right right corner um, any this is our policy template whenever we write a new policy um, we we write it up in this template and that right side has a, a place for st field stakeholder review and yes or no and yes is expected so we've created an environment where that's just this is just an easy thing that someone that wants to um, you know commit themselves to consumer in engagement um, can do to to kind of force that to to happen. So any policy we make, it's just part of our DNA that we um, make sure that that policy is reviewed um, by by our stakeholders, and we have those discussions and and present that to, to folks. So I wanted to to kind of share that. And we're learning um, so much with with COVID-19 about how to how to change, um, what changes that creates to our environment. Before there were lockdowns, we made it optional when we knew the virus of, was in um, Oregon for our, our committees to meet virtually. And we were able to put that together and folks universally chose to do that before it was, there was a lockdown and, and so that's an example of um, of, of being able um, to change the way you do things in the moment um, to do that. And then we're we have an experience in one community, a, a very small rural community, maybe a thousand lives in that town, where they're um, they had never done public meetings over um, that could be participated you know online and so because of the covid crisis they they did that and they went from an average of like three people participating in their in their um, city meetings to 600 which was about two-thirds of the town participated in that meeting so even though um the environment has has changed we can do things that we we're learning new things that that can be more inclusive of more people being involved in our in in our decision making so so not all is negative in terms of of the direction we're we're going and um we're learning that we can we've had a hard time you know representing urban versus rural at times and so some of these technological things we've been forced to move to with with COVID-19 has allowed maybe more rural participation in in our programs so um so a lot that can be done in the environment, even in trying times that can improve um, um, engagement and and, um, and use of folks. And I think that I'll turn it over to Keith now for his his ideas. Keith, are you there? Yes. Yes, yeah. I'm here. All right. So uh, the. When you talk about environment, one of the things that um, what we found in terms of being an advocate or being on, uh, a chair or being a person putting together the strategy or putting together the voices is understanding that the environment also means the, the outside social environment in terms of whether or not the people who you're bringing in feel like they will actually be heard, will they be valued, will you not be just a typical bureaucrat uh, as you heard before, but really understanding one of the one of the central questions in the community is if you are a public servant and you are serving the public, why must you be convinced that the public has a voice in what happens to the public? That that one sentiment has now permeated the environment in which we're talking about now. 
because what what the moving forward what happened a year ago cannot happen going forward in the next 20 years people's voices people are no longer looking for people to be told what their lives are going to become they're looking to be active participants in shaping the best possible outcome so how do you set that one is understanding that as much as it is your job and i'm going to say this until it until it makes sense to everybody that it is their life that that fundamental perspective shapes the environment in which you negotiate with the con with the community on how to deliver those services and secondly understanding whatever historical backdrop to whatever community you are attempting to engage in and understanding that it's a two-way street so if you under if you encourage if you incur undue bias or undue prejudice that may be a reflexive reaction to the historical treatment that those communities have gotten whether or not they've been heard whether or not they've been engaged whether or not they've been serviced as you mentioned as you've heard the urban the urban suburban and rural divide uh, for some communities seems a little perplexing if you're a state agency uh, if you're a state agency and there are holes in your coverage then are you a state agency so setting the environment means being candid with the people you're engaging, understanding that absolutely at the end of the process, the ones who are most directly infected are the ones who you should be speaking to. And thirdly, making sure that the environment beyond just being truthful is a safe place where some communities feel like they won't speak up because there is a potential retribution, whether directly or indirectly. So making sure that the space is safe for them to be candid Make sure that you understand the historical backdrop of the community you're trying to engage and making sure that it's not tokenism, that the words that they speak to you actually will be embedded in the policies going forward. Thanks, Keith. Um, so you heard a lot from the panel about environmental factors. Um, and then the next slide, I think I summarized some of the key ones here. Um, Keith just mentioned the whole concept of it's actually, you know, that the, the engagement is part of the policy structure and Bob had put on the screen an example of how his team or how Oregon has has worked to and make sure stakeholder engagement is part of their policies and procedure practice. That's an example of an environment that could be perceived as ready for engagement. Right. So we're really just talking about a government climate that encourages transparency and collaborative decision making. Um, and as you, as you probably kind of see at this point, um, environment influences your people and your approach. So if you have an environment where leadership is, is open to communication and it's kind of an open um, two-way communication, transparent strategy set from the top up, you're probably more likely to see meaningful um, engagement strategies uh, because they're expected. Um, a desire for change for those within government and external stakeholders, some of the most meaningful engagement I've seen happen is during budget, cr budget crunches where people turn around and say, hey, we got to cut some services. Um, you could do that in a vacuum or you can bring stakeholders together and have some really conversation, difficult conversations and prioritization practices. Yes, conflict will happen. <laughs> Facilitation must be strong. But the government or, or the, these external stakeholders in the government were both looking for change that people um, could sit with. Um, this whole concept of definition of expert, I didn't talk much about previously, but I noticed a conversation going on in the chat about stipends and people um, paying people to participate with an honorarium or a stipend or an hourly peer role. Um, and it's, it's true, that is an approach factor. Um, it's one of the elements that I would argue is probably in a lot of handbooks about, you know, the benefits and the meaning of developing ways in which to recognize people's time and to get them to show up by giving people not only reimbursement for travel or other accommodations, but a stipend. Um, and what I would say is that's coming, although it's an approach factor, it's coming from this bottom left hand box where we talk about the, the culture in which we're defining expert broadly. And it's no longer just um, me as a person with a such and such policy degree or experience, 25 years of experience um, designing programs that, hey, I understand. And there's a culture around me that understands that you live this, you have lived experience. We all have lived experience, but you have lived experience specific to this program 
or this community. And that's worthy of as much financial reimbursement as maybe some other experts. So thinking about even the culture that sets the tone for that. Um, and then of course I did talk about budget being a, um, in an approach factor, but the, again, the culture in which engagement is taken seriously will then also lead to the allocation of staff and financial resources to make engagement happen. Um, oftentimes, if that budget isn't allocated from the top, we're not thinking that as we're planning out budgets and grants, um, that it can get lost. And then we're trying to do a lot with very little. Um, so it's definitely, to me, a, an example of an environmental factor. Um, so I think with that, I'm going to move to the next slide with some key takeaways. Um, I don't know if you guys can see me, but I can't see me, but I hope you can. <laughs> um, the pay attention framework um, is what we've discussed today. And it reminds us that many factors inform engagement outcomes. So please, if you get anything out of the session, when somebody said, I did engagement and it was amazing, or I did engagement and it was really frustrating and I never want to be a part of a process again, um, understand that there were probably people, approach, and environmental factors that played into that. And they all, it's not one bucket or the other, they all influence each other. It's a beautiful um, ball of yarn. Uh, engagement takes time, it will never be perfect. Don't let that stop you. Start somewhere, be genuine to, Bob, to Bob's point, be honest, learn from it, then improve it. There's been many of times where I have done something wrong, but my ability to listen and then improve that situation the next time around has what made the outcomes um, more successful. Conflict, like we said, is part of the process. It's important to um, put people in engagement um, positions that are, are, are going to run towards constructive conflict and set a safe environment for everybody. And that conflict, if dealt with well, will lead to positive outcomes. Um, and building trust takes time. It's just, again, from the research I did, a whole chapter on representation, a whole chapter on trust, and the, and the fact that all of these factors really seem to play into trust. If you're consistent, if you're genuine, if you um, ask people their accessibility needs and follow through. Um, if you budget funds for it and just thank it builds trust and all of that is conducive to your success. Um, with that, I think we are done with our piece and I'm gonna hand it over, I think, to Bevan. Yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, Erin uh, and Bob, Keith, for this discussion and thank you too to everybody in chat who's been sharing all kinds of awesome resources and uh, making some really great points. I have really enjoyed um, seeing all of this. Um, so we have a, a number of questions um, here. Uh, we may not get to all of them, but uh, if we don't, we, we can um, always um, post the responses to chat along with the resources that were shared. Um, uh, later on on our website um, when we pull together our resource package to go with the webinar slides and recording. Um, so we got a couple of questions at the beginning um, um, around um, supporting people to build the, the skills to participate, to be engaged. So a lot of people don't know how to speak up because they've never been encouraged to do it. Um, uh, what are some strategies that could be used to help uh, to get others to take the initiative and speak up? Because a lot of times um, people may be given the opportunity to speak up but don't know how. Um, and then similarly, we got a question about self-advocacy training um, to complement stakeholder engagement and can you provide any details or information about um, about that and how it fits within your framework who wants to jump in I can I can is somebody want to jump in before me this is Aaron oh uh, I, yeah um, I guess in terms of how to go about it and how to and how to get meaningful stakeholder development and how do you build the skill set? Uh, it's a two way street. One one is uh, so the skill sets go both ways. One is you set the example by having a mentorship. Uh, maybe there's an advocate that's um, done it before, and then support that advocate in bringing along other people and showing them the way that they learned it. Uh, that's one way. There's also supporting those workshops and, and building that training into the process of engagement. We want to engage you and this is how 
this is the language that we speak and this is these are the acronyms and this is the alphabet soup now when we say this what does that mean to you and building a common dialogue and then going from there none of this work will be done in in two days but the most important part or the key to now um you know having meaningful stakeholder involvement is again i have to re remind us we are not we are not where we were a year ago everything going forward cannot be the presumption that we that the expert is the state and the public official and you lowly humans we will allow you to chime in when we we deem necessary it has to be a ground up partnership whatever comes across the desk of your supervisor the question should be asked who 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 is at the end of this policy what does, what would they say about this policy and that should always drive you to say let's go ask so that's that's one of the ways in developing a, a great connection to the community building the skill set and allowing people to feel like they're not just showing up to be tokens that they're actually active in their government great and then um i think also ann and bob is there anything you want to add to that If not, I can I can jump in if you're thinking. But I would say um, I agree that we've seen that mentoring role um, be really helpful in assigning kind of somebody uh, an informal mentor in the process. We've also seen dedicating 30 minutes before meetings as an open place to just ask questions and share concerns or confusion before the meeting as a great way to help people build the confidence um, in preparation for an engagement. I think I would plug um, some work that we're doing right now um, with the NCAPS team around the asset mapping process, which really just simply means stopping to ask what engagement assets are already in existence and working very well. I mean, there are a lot of advocacy groups out there that already have well-developed advocacy and self-advocacy trainings. Um, and really, when you do your asset mapping, you can stop and identify these these groups of in your in your community for which you can already tap and engage in your engagement process and maybe create some sort of partnership for mentoring and for for skill building and training. I think we we're clear that um, you know that this is an, a process that people learn with time, and that's why I say doing um, multiple stakeholders with different types of experience is beneficial. What I, um, what I would assume is that people as they're engaged develop in time, develop their confidence and can engage meaningful. What we don't want is people to kind of what I would call punch and cookie groups, where you know I personally feel like it's uncomfortable when you bring people in and don't give them a time to grow into the position and support them in the mentoring or somebody supports them because it really, then you're not having the, comp people are not developing the confidence and the comfort level with pushing back and asking questions that might actually improve your work. Most, most states have self-advocacy leadership series and self-advocacy leadership groups. Yes, thank you, and I knew you'd chime in on that one because Anne, Anne participates in a lot of them. <laughs> All right, um, the next question I think can be a crowdsource question and a question for the panelists, and that's, um, uh, if you can name any groups, agencies that you've worked with um, that seem to be at the forefront of this um, of this work, any um, any any um, entities that are using this pay pay attention framework successfully, um, uh, you know that 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 we can look to as examples. And if folks have examples, I know there's lots of folks um, listening in who may have ideas too. So you could put those into chat. Any shout outs? I have shout outs, Bevan. <laughs> this is Erin again, and I am um, doing NCAPS work with um, technical assistance expert around stakeholder engagement. And I'm looking at my board right now, and I mean, I'm assuming you're all here and listening and, and, and nodding your head, but Utah, Montana, Virginia, Ohio, Oregon, and even North Dakota are all states that have either um, piloted this this asset mapping tool process where you kind of take a moment to ask some really open-ended brainstorming questions about who we try to engage and what are the assets that are already out there to then um, really 
some other states going, okay, sometimes engagements worked well, and again, not so well. What did we learn from that? And what can, how can we build on that in an engagement plan? So I think all of those states that I mentioned, specifically um, Utah has used the asset mapping process to develop um, almost a resource directory of, web, of, of resources in the community that not only they can engage in their stakeholder engagement process, but other people in the community can tap as well. Um, so I think that there's a lot of exciting things going on there. Um, and I think within the NCAPS work, we've been able to you know, explore our lessons learned from previous work, do some asset mapping, and develop really concrete engagement plans with what I would call low hanging fruit as starting points, like not getting too overwhelmed, but really asking ourselves, what can we do in three months? What can we do in six months? All of those plans have multiple engagement strategies and not just say one council, but using a council in addition to community meetings and or website, um, access to information has been beneficial. Anyone else want to speak to that or in terms of assets? So I can quickly just tell you all as an update, this asset map that Aaron is referencing um, is a tool that um, Aaron has developed um, with NCAPS jointly um, in the course of working with the, the, the states that Aaron listed. And it's a growing number of states because I think uh, it's a sort of an intuitive process um, that states are finding extremely useful to understand um, who their stakeholders are. Um, and uh, that asset mapping toolkit, um, which is actually quite fantastic and detailed, um, is going to be available, um, I would say, within the next few weeks um, on the NCAPS website. And you will um, receive an email um, when that toolkit is available, if that's something you're interested in, um, in checking out. And um, I see we've got some Utah folks on the webinar now, and Saska, um, who's um, been fantastic to work with in Utah, actually set, put a link in chat to the, um, to the results of their asset mapping process, which they put online. Um, OK, I think we have time for um let's see do we have time for one more you know what i think i think what i would like to do um since we are almost at the end instead of squeezing in one last question i will tell you um that we're going to work with the presenters to get written um, answers to all of the questions that we didn't get to so if you asked a question um we will um get a written answer to you and we'll also compile the awesome resources that were shared here um, into a resource list, along with some of the other resources that Erin included on her slides. And all of that's gonna be available um, on our website in a few weeks and you'll get an email about that. Um, but just in the last um, couple of minutes, what I would like to do is um, thank everyone um, for, uh, for coming to this webinar, for being so engaged in chat. Um, I hope you learned something and got something out of this. I know I certainly have, it's been, a real pleasure um, to see uh, Aaron, uh, Aaron's framework um, uh, be put into practice in a lot of different states through NCAPS technical assistance. Um, it's been wonderful to hear from Bob and Keith and Anne um, about their own um, experiences with engagement. So thank you to all of the panelists. We appreciate you. Um, before everyone signs off, Connor, if you could put up um, our evaluation survey. We like to leave just like one minute at the very end of each um, NCAPS webinar to give folks time within this webinar time that you've already allotted um, to tell us how we did with this webinar. Um, let us know um, what you think. We use this information to inform um, future webinars. Um, we hope to see you again. Uh, our next webinar in July is going to be focused on applying person-centered planning tools to uh, cope with the current times and with the COVID pandemic. And we have assembled a panel of, uh, of experts to, to share um, some tools and strategies around that. So you can register for that um, uh, webinar on our website. Um, and we will continue to be working hard to offer um, future webinars to you. Um, so thank you again for tuning in, for being part of the NCAPS community, and we will reconvene again in a month or so. Bye, everyone.
Thank you. Bye. And we'll leave the evaluation questions up if folks want to um, stick around and take their time with those. Be sure to scroll down. There are um, there are six questions in all. All right. Take care, everybody.